So hi everyone and welcome to the very first video in our module on investment decisions using the expected utility criterion. So in the last module, we covered uh, the breadth of financial decision making under uncertainty. And we said that when uncertainty plays a role, we would need to be dealing with probability distributions as such. And we also came up with a couple of conclusions that can sort of guide us in terms of making financial decisions. The first of which is that the typical criterion that one would think, which is the expected value criterion, is not often uh, very good in this analysis. It's often uh, flawed in some sense. And that's because um, people don't necessarily judge things based on the basis of expected value, but rather on uh, the utility that they gave, as we said. And we posited this expected utility theorem, which factors in more things than just the expected value. Um, there are a couple more things that we discussed, such as the concepts of the certainty equivalent and uh, Jensen's inequality, as well as the risk premia, which are concepts that, you know, uh, sort of circulate this world of finance. So we're start, um, we answered essentially in the last module, if a person would be um, going, or if they would take a one investment or another investment, or um, I'm sorry, uh, it's not really one investment or another, but whether they would take the investment or not. And we said that we could judge those by the basis of expected utility. So in essence, this sort of module that we're gonna discuss here is a sort of application of that, but in terms of answering the question, how much should you allocate on uh, certain sort of investments? So of course, in the world of the financial markets, there are many investments you could make. You could make an investment in the equities market, in the bond market, in the money markets, and in the foreign exchange market. So there are many things that you could put uh, your money into. And you want to know or how do you allocate your funds across these securities. So it's in essence some sort of portfolio management, but we're going to start at the most basic level, which is in essence the asset allocation problem. So we'll move there. So we first have to ask the question, which is the most basic question, which is essentially why do we invest? And investment, you know, as we define it, is the buying, holding, and selling at a future uh, date of um, it's buying, holding, and selling financial assets at a future date, right? And investment in a financial asset increases wealth, right, uh, via the returns. So uh, as we said in financial decision-making under uncertainty, generally returns are random things. But when we make investments, we make them in the hope that they will yield a positive return at some future payoff. That future payoff, of course, is not today, it's in the future. Hence, the return will be some factor in the future. And this is because by foregoing consumption today and investing the savings, investors expect to enhance their wealth uh, or their future consumption um, because they ha now have a higher wealth than before, right? And thus, in essence, the goal is to invest. Uh, and it's one way for us to be able to maximize an individual's expected utility. Right, expected because we're dealing with conditions that are not certain. So some key questions to ask before we begin the module. Uh, first is how do you describe the relevant features of a financial asset to an investor? And the second is how will the investor's wealth position be affected if he or she invests in this asset? So as we know that there are, uh, there are assets that are generally risk-free and there are those that are risky. And in essence, uh, we, ha we have to learn how to describe to an investor what constitutes a risky asset, what constitutes a riskless asset, and how will uh, an investor's wealth position or their current wealth standing be influenced by the fact that um, they invest in a riskless asset or a, risk or a risky asset. So those are considerations that you would need to ask. And in essence, this is the rationale for a portfolio. We want to find measures of the effect on relative wealth at the end of an investment period, i.e. your end of period wealth. So for example, consider only uh, an investment with only a single period, okay? The link between the end of period wealth and the initial peso investment or the, the initial monetary investment is the rate of the return of the investment in a, part in a portfolio financial asset. So 
in, in essence, it's just, this just means that if you have a portfolio of assets, which are like a collection of risk-free and risk uh, and risky assets, each of these sort of securities inside will have a rate of return, right? And this portfolio that we were discussing, as I said, it's a combination of assets. There can be risk-free assets there and there can be risky assets there. And this similar portfolio theory was studied a long time ago and it's still heavily being studied today. And the works back in 1950 by Harry Markowitz are still pretty much used today. And there are essentially two main activities in portfolio management, in essence, two questions that we ask. The first is where uh, we're gonna allocate our assets to. So how will we allocate our wealth? And that's asset allocation. So it's the blending together of major asset classes, risk-free assets and risky assets in the individual's portfolio. And then you have a security selection within asset classes. So for example, if you have in the risky assets, of course, there would be some there that would likely be the equities. How would you choose the specific equity stocks that would comprise your portfolio in the equities part? So that's the security selection. So choosing, the, choosing which uh, should be there and also choosing how much of your total portfolio is composed of uh, these things. So for example, a risk averse person would most likely allocate a um, relatively high proportion of their entire portfolio to risk uh, free assets vis-a-vis -vis someone who is more risk hungry, which would likely, um, that person would likely have more, um, more risk, uh, a higher proportion in the risky assets. So uh, that's asset allocation and the security selection. So let's deal first with the asset allocation problem, right? And the asset allocation problem is essentially to determine the optimal peso value, right? Or the peso amount to invest in risk-free and risky assets. Essentially, how much should I invest in risk-free assets? How much should I invest in risky assets? Right? What's the proportion? So we need to uh, sort of pin down a couple of uh, mathematical terms. So like before, we let W not be the investor's current wealth, which is available for investment. Then alpha, is the amount uh, to be invested in the risky assets or portfolio out of the current wealth. So the uh, alpha is generally um, uh, what the person invests in a risky asset. Then you have W naught minus alpha, which is the amount to invest in a risk-free asset out of current wealth. So if you think about it, it makes sense. W naught is the amount that you can invest. You can invest alpha in a risky asset and the remainder, which is W naught minus alpha, is invested in a risk-free asset. Then you have R tilde, which is the uncertain rate of return on a risky asset. So that's, uh, that's that unex uh, you know, uncertain rate of return. And uh, that constitutes just for the, risk, uh, uh, the risky assets. And then you have RF, which is the uh, rate of return for a risk-free asset. Right. So you have two rates of return, one for a risky asset, which is R tilde. Then you have RF, which is the rate of return for a risk-free asset. So if we assume a one-period investment horizon, so that's one month or one year, okay, if W tilde is an investor's wealth at the end of the investment period, that's their final wealth, then W tilde, which is the final wealth, is essentially equal to, this is again the amount this is the amount in risk-free asset, uh, risk-free assets, right? Then this one is essentially, right? This is RF, which is the return, one plus, that's the rate of return. This is the rate of return on risk-free. Then again, you have alpha, which is the amount in risky assets, right? The risky assets. And then you have this, which is the rate of return of your uh, risky assets, right? Which makes sense. And note that since W uh, has a tilde on it, right? We all we denote this even before the the final wealth. So the final wealth, the final wealth is uncertain, right? Because uh, remember, you know, for the most part, this part of it is certain. Right, this part because this is risk free, but this part and especially that part, there are uncertain things, right? So the R tilde here influences a lot of the things going on because, as I as I said, 
a risky asset is a risky asset. It is associated with an uncertain payoff. So there's a, uh, the final wealth is, a, in essence, a risky wealth, right? So since R is uncertain, then W is also subsequently uncertain. And as before, an individual who behaves according to the expected utility theorem will choose a level of alpha such that the expected, uh, the expected value of the utility is maximized, or the expected utility, where the utility is the investor's utility function under uncertainty. So that was the one that we discussed before. So what's the goal of the consumer? How do we formulate this mathematically? Well, the goal is, again, to maximize the expected utility. So this is expected utility. And mathematically, we said that the utility looked something like this, right? And as before, we assume that individuals prefer more, more wealth to less wealth. So they are non-satiated. That's this assumption here. Then we also assume that investors are risk averse. That is this assumption here. So non-satiation non implies that the first order derivative is greater than zero. Risk aversion implies that the second order derivative is, is less than zero for all W, uh, for all positive levels of wealth. So if you take the first order condition with respect to alpha, which is the amount that you invest in the risky assets, so you take the derivative of that and equate to zero, you get, um, you end up uh, with th this condition here. And when you derive it further, you're just going to, um, you, you can sort of note this down as something that looks like that. Okay, so you can derive it on your own time. So we ask ourselves, right, under what conditions will it be optimal for a risk averse investor to invest a positive amount of his wealth on the risky portfolio? So, you know, we know that investors are risk averse and that they would prefer a certain outcome over an uncertain outcome. But there are many instances wherein one would be, one would be a risk averse person, but, but would still be willing to um, allocate some proportion of his or her wealth, a positive amount of his or her wealth, to the investment in a risky portfolio. And essentially, this question is asking, uh, when is alpha greater than zero like an optimal thing to do? And Remember, when alpha is essentially positive, it means that the investor allocated some amount to the risky uh, portfolio. If alpha is equal to zero, then the investor just allocated everything to risk-free assets. So we're going to ask the question, when is it a good, um, uh, a good situation to invest in risky assets, at least for a risk-averse investor? And the first order condition allows us to describe this relationship, the one that we derived in the past slide, between the investor's degree of risk aversion, which we discussed before, and his portfolio composition via the following theorem. So we're going to discuss a couple of theorems. This is the first one and arguably the most important one. And it's kind of simple to understand. That is, according to Kenneth Arrow in 1971, under the assumption that individuals are non-satiated and that they are risk averse, again, those are those two derivatives there, and we let alpha hat be the solution to the investor's expected utility maximization problem above, okay, then it must be that these three conditions hold. So let's try to analyze intuitively. If alpha hat is greater than zero, that is um, the optimal thing to do is to invest uh, at least some part in the risky assets. It must be that if this was the chosen solution, it must be that the expected rate of return on the risky asset minus the rate of return of the risk-free asset is greater than zero. This is just another way of saying that uh, I can just transpose this to the other side so that this is greater than RF. And this kind of makes sense. A person would be willing to invest right, in a, um, in a risky asset class, right? If the expected rate of return in that asset, in that risky asset, is greater than the risk-free rate, right? Definitely, there would be some incentive for the consumer to sort of uh, invest something there. There's, there's going to be some incentive there. But if we find that the optimal thing for the consumer to do is not to invest in anything, is like not to invest in anything, uh, I'm sorry, not to invest in the risky asset, 
it just means that the expected rate of return is equal to Rf. And obviously, right, the expected rate of return, which is this one on a risky asset, is still uncertain. If it's equal to your risk-free assets rate of return, then you should just go for the rate of return of the risk-free asset, right? Because they approximately yield the same expected value and you're not going to be dealing with the uncertainty. In essence, this is our sort of fair game theory that we've been discussing so far. You'd rather choose a certain outcome than that of an uncertain outcome, especially if both of these things yield the same um, expected value. The last one is that uh, you should obviously not invest in, um, in risky assets if the rate of return of the risk-free asset is greater. Because if the rate of return of a risk-free asset is greater and that of a risky asset is lower, then you can just be much better off just investing in a risk-free asset, not having to deal with the uncertainty, and even getting a higher return that you would have had you taken the risk. So it's obvious from that standpoint. So this is the formal proof for Arrow 1971, that's theorem one. If we let Z alpha be the function that we had earlier, so this is the expected utility function. So if you remember, this was how we formulated. Then the FOC, which is essentially deriving this function by alpha. So it's like D Z, uh, I'm sorry, it's partial, right? Partial Z alpha over partial alpha. Uh, then we equate that to zero we are going to get this derivative here. And since you know that uh, by risk aversion, the second order derivative is zero, uh, is less than zero, you know that this part here is zero, then that is as z uh, tilde, uh, I'm sorry, z prime a decreases, then uh, a increases. And this has, of course, some implication. And it follows that at an optimal alpha, alpha hat will be positive if and only if, um, this one is going to be that. So this is just a restatement of the proof that we had. By risk aversion, you get this. It will only be positive if we're missing that there. This one here is greater than zero, since in this case, alpha will have to be increased from its value of zero to achieve equality in the first order condition. So since um, people are inherently risk averse, this implies that alpha hat is greater than zero if and only if this uh, expectation is greater than zero. And uh, remember, right, this expectation, right, uh, minus RF, you can spread it around. You know that the rate of return of a risky asset is uncertain, so that remains there. But the expected value of RF, well, that's a certain thing, so that's just RF, right? And that was the conclusion we derived earlier, uh, or that we explained earlier in the theory of RO. And we said that that could only be, um, uh, that alpha hat would only be positive if and only if this was greater than zero, right? So that's our conclusion. A risk averse investor will invest in the risky asset or portfolio only if the expected rate of return on the risky asset exceeds the risk free rate. So uh, I think we can uh, end the video on that. We're going to start with an example in the next video, but I hope you were able to see uh, a very simple sort of proof, a very simple fundamental theorem in finance that, of course, it's rational for a person to still invest in a risky asset for as long as the rate of return in that risky asset is greater than the risk-free rate. So thank you for your attention, and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much.